Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross, coming at you late this week. So I want to talk about some of the larger themes behind last week's title winners on the ATP side, Andre Rublev and um, Felix Oje Aliassim, talking about their seasons as a whole uh, because they're two players that I think have some uh, interesting things to consider uh, from this 2022 season already. Obviously, it's not over yet. One more Masters 1000 left, the year-end championships, which I do think both Felix and Andre will both be participating in uh, sixth and seventh in the race, respectively, right now. Also want to discuss J.J. Wolf, who had a really good run in Florence, really the, the best run of his career by a mile. Uh, his young career, he's got gotten off to a late start in certain ways, but he's a, a really, really unique player. I want to look at his return in a little bit of film study coming up later, and then uh, I'm going to end on Dominic Team, who... Is looking better and better, and uh, I just want to share some observations on where he's at in his comeback, um, his comeback kind of to the the top 100, which looks like it's coming real fast. And um, obviously, he hopes to rise far beyond that, and it's looking like he will. Again, looking better, but I have some observations. Let's start with Rublev wins the title in Hyon, Spain. But I, I, I want to get into a season. I want to talk about, is Andre Rublev having a good season? Let's start with the basics here. He's 47 and 16. Win percentage of 74%. That is better than last year. That's worse than 2020. When he had the biggest year of his career, won five titles in the abbreviated you know, COVID-shortened season. This he owned title, the fourth of the year, which is an excellent number. He's undefeated in finals. He's sixth in the race, as I mentioned, looking really good, almost a lock for his third straight qualification at the Nitto ATP finals. Nine times this year, he's reached the semifinals or better at an event. Those are really awesome numbers, every single one of them. From the record, to the number of titles, to where he's at in the race is good. How many deep runs he's made, titles aside. But when you pick it apart, you start to see some more nuance, obviously. That is true for any player. So let's do that. Let's pick it apart a little bit. Adjust the win-loss record for ranking which is something I love to do. I think it it's a great representation um, of really where a player stands when you break down their win-loss record by ranking. And that looks like this for Rublev. He picked up a pair of top 50 wins on his title run in Hyon. So his record now against top 50 opponents is 17-13 and 13 in 2022. Against opponents ranked outside the top 50, he's 30 and 3. So, what that tells you is he is beating players outside the top 50 at an efficiency and with the kind of consistency that is very, very rare. That only really top players are able to achieve. 30 and 3 as a record it means he's rarely taking, you know, surprising upset defeats. Rarely. But he's a top 10 player, a top 10 player, which means he should have a, or, or he would like to have a pretty convincing record also against top 50 opponents, ideally. He doesn't really have that. He came into this week 15 and 13 against top 50 opponents, which, you know, a little bit over 500. You don't really want it to be a toss up, but okay, uh, good week. Two wins over top 50 opponents. He's 17 and 13. That's okay. It's only all right. So now the question is, what has that translated into? How do we take what we learn about, well, you know, how he's doing against the high quality opponents versus the lower quality opponents? I think the biggest, 
the biggest thing that you can take away from that or extrapolate uh, from that is, well, it means he's done awesome at the smaller events, which we've seen in the past. And he, he's done not so great in the bigger, in the biggest and most important events. Uh, if you look at his nine semifinal or better results, eight of them are at 250s and 500s. You look at the best draws that we have on the calendar, Masters 1000s. Those are the best draws on the calendar. Better than majors. Majors, you usually, you know, as a, a top eight seed, you face two or three players outside the top 50, generally speaking, until you face a top 50 opponent. Masters, you don't get that luxury. Right away into the teeth of the top 50 in the rankings, oftentimes. Rublev's record at Masters 1000s this year is 8-7. and seven. The only run he's made, first Masters of the year, Indian Wells. Made the semis there. It's the only run he's made. So 8-7 and seven at Masters. Let's look at the majors. Unfortunately, banned from Wimbledon. Round of 16 in Australia loses to Chilich. Quarterfinal at Roland Garros loses to Chilich. Quarterfinal at the U.S. Open loses to Tiafo. Chilich and Tiafo, really good players. But he's the favorite in all three. He's the higher ranked player in all three. So with all of, I, I think I've provided all the information. What he's done um, in terms of overall number statistics, and then how we can kind of parse that and see where he's succeeding and where he's failing. So uh, let's answer the question. Is Rublev having a good, a good season? Again, things can change. And I'll get into that. But is he having a good season right now? To answer that, you got to say, okay, what what was a reasonable goal coming into the year? I think a reasonable goal for Andre Rublev coming into 2022 is win a big title. So a Masters or a Major, win a big title or make a major semifinal. Ultimately, you know, what was realistic? Realistic was try to win a Masters. That, that would be a successful season if you're able to win a Masters. That would be the next step or make a major semifinal. Instead, he's going to leave 2022 0-5 in major quarterfinals. And unlike the first couple quarterfinals of his career where he came in against opponents that were you know better than him, he was an underdog, he's actually come into these quarterfinals as the favorite. So I think those were reasonable goals win a master, make a major semifinal or beyond, didn't achieve that. So despite all the success he's had at 250s, 500s, the great win-loss record, the four titles, undefeated in finals, sixth in the race, nine times semifinals or better, all that is great. But to me, we've seen that before. If the reasonable goal was to take the next step in his career, which I think at his age, 24 years old, it, it it's not unfair to to expect that you know Andre at this point wants to be taking baby steps forward we we haven't quite seen that so i don't really think it's been a successful season for Andre Rublev despite all of his successes he's got one more masters left paris if he wins that although i think bercy is the least important masters 1000 title yeah that changes a lot that changes a ton if he makes he doesn't even need to win the year-end championships. If he makes the final there, or if he wins it, that changes a lot. That might change the answer to that question. In fact, I think it would. Moving on to Felix Ojealiasim. Same question for him. I'm not going to go as in-depth for FAA. But he's a guy who I do think is having a successful season. I think 2022, regardless of what happens from here on out, Although I think he, he does need to qualify for the ATP finals, uh, potentially for, for actually to kind of lock this in. But I'm pretty sure we're looking at, if we're going to be binary, black and white, yes or no, I think Felix is having a good season. To me, it's a success. You look at his goals coming into the year. The main goal, obviously, win a title of any kind. Just win a title. Second reasonable goal after finishing 11th in the race last year, this year you try to make the top eight. Any young player 
who's going to finish just outside of year-end championship qualification. They're going to come into the next year hoping to be on the inside looking out instead of the outside looking in. So I think Felix is going to go two for two on those reasonable goals. And ultimately, it's going to be a successful season for him. Now, he isn't having the enormous breakout year that I thought he was on his way to having at the beginning of the March. At the beginning of March, after how he looked in January and February, first couple months of the season, I thought that he was a rocket ship. I thought that he was, I thought he had a chance to be a top five player in the world this year. It hasn't been that. The inconsistency has been very, very present in his results. But it's just not fair to change the goalposts like that after after his hot start. You can't you can't shift the goalposts on him just because he got off to a really good start in the season. Ultimately, coming into the year, there were two things that needed to happen. He needed to win a title. Now he's got two after winning in Florence this week, or last week, I should say. And it's looking like he'll make the year-end championships for the first time. Remember, FAA and Rublev, they're in different spots in their career. Felix is, I, I still think that this is a, uh, uh, a fact that is often forgotten, but Felix Ojeale seems 22 years old. So he's uh, a couple of years behind Andre Rublev, and the expectations um, should represent that. They should follow that, uh, given the trajectory of FAA's career. But again, that, that trajectory word that I just used, I think it's an important one because that's what I'm looking for here. And that's what I think players look to achieve is to get better year after year. And I think uh, with Felix's 2022, he's done that. Now, I will also say, do notice that all three finals he's played this year have come on indoor hard. It's, it's not really a criticism. It's not a bad thing. But you don't want to be the player who gets their best results on indoor hardcourt. And right now, the titles for Felix, Rotterdam, and Florence, indoor hardcourts, uh, really uh, awesome win at, at Davis Cup, really often uh, against Alcaraz, really awesome win at Labor Cup against Djokovic. A, a lot of indoor hardcourt things happening here. And you really do want to see um, that translate to outdoor tennis. Now, he's had some uh, impressive losses outdoors. When I say impressive losses, I'm talking Medvedev Australian Open, Nadal Roland Garros. I don't say that sarcastically. I, I genuinely mean they're impressive losses. So uh, that's been there. But but certainly, that's the the bone that you pick with FAA's resume this season is that his a lot of his success has been indoors. And uh, I make no apology about this. I'm not saying it should be like this. It shouldn't be like this. But it's just a reality. Indoor hardcore is less important. It's just it's just less important. That's the facts. There are no majors. I think that is uh, the root of the issue with indoor hardcore. I think as a result of that, the biggest lulls in the calendar... February and October, there's no doubt about it. That's when interest in tennis is at its lowest. Uh, that is when motivation is most erratic. That is when a lot of the, the very elite top players will take a break. The lulls on the calendar. Look, it's a long season. There's got to be some lulls on the calendar. It just happens to be, in this case... February after the Australian Open when you hit the indoor hard courts and October after the U.S. Open when you hit the indoor hard court. That's how it is. Now, Felix is a player who relies on fine margin aggression, big serving, pinpoint first serves, deadly accurate and damaging first forehands, subsequent forehands. So, um, and we've talked about, the, you know, the margin sometimes being a weakness, you know, he's hitting into targets that are too ambitious and he's making unforced errors that he doesn't really need to be making because he's he's going for too much. We've talked about that on his forehand, his forehand, which 
should be a, a cons consistently an incredible weapon. Unfortunately, for most of his career, has been a uh, kind of a, a Jekyll and Hyde situation where sometimes it is elite, sometimes it is the reason he's losing matches, and there's very little in between. Uh, it makes sense that we see the former, the reason he's winning matches, more than the latter, the reason he's losing them on indoor hard courts because you take away the wind and that's a big deal. When we talk about small margins, we're looking at, at the difference in timing the ball, you know, milliseconds. Milliseconds is the difference between hitting the ball in or out when it comes to timing the, the ball when you're going for the sidelines like that. And you take away wind, and that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. And obviously players who want to lean on, you know, great serving, um, still conditions will also be ideal for that. So it's not surprising that the indoor hard courts are good for Felix, uh, but the better he does outside, the less we'll have to talk about how good he is inside, and that is a very, very good thing. That's a 2023 storyline. When we're having this same conversation at this time next year about FAA season, I think one of the things on the checklist will be score some big results potentially titles in the most important parts of the year, which just happened to be outdoor events. Let's talk about the man Felix beat in the final, J.J. Wolf. Uh, fascinating, fascinating game on the American. Came into the event having never won a single match outside of North America. So this is a player with uh, not a lot of sample size, uh, attended college for three years at Ohio State, had a good... Uh, 2021 of, uh, sorry, 2020 kind of rising up the ranks. That's kind of interrupted by COVID. And then last year he gets injured with uh, a double hernia surgery. It, it wasn't supposed to be a double hernia surgery, but he had the surgery once. It, it didn't work. Um, he got into a car accident the day after the surgery. I'm still unclear on if that messed up the recovery or if that's just a, a footnote. Regardless, four months were up. He came back onto the court, still having pain, had to do the surgery again. So he was uh, out with injury eight months last year. And now uh, just, you know, just in 2022, he's finally had a relatively healthy season and he's been able to break into the top 100 and start to play some consistent tour level tennis for the first time. So everything about J.J. Wolf's come up has been delayed. And that's why he's 23 years old. Uh, career high ranking now inside the top. I don't know where he's at exactly. I believe he's inside the top uh, 60 or just outside the top 60. Not sure which one. Um, 63 or higher. I think 63 is where he was at. I see I see in my notes here because um, I, I did some commentary on the on his semifinal against Emer um, on Tennis Channel. So... That's the deal. That's the backstory with J.J. Wolf. But this week, he beats uh, Fran uh, Francesco Maestrelli, Maxime Cressy, Alexander Bublik, uh, Michael Emer in the semifinals. Emer's playing awesome. Uh, really tough out. And then he battled well against FAA, lost in that final 6-4, 6-4. I want to talk about his play style, though, because it's, it's crazy. It's crazy stuff. When I first saw J.J. Wolf, I really didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. And I was, I was dubious. I said, all right, so this guy is six feet tall and he's basically going to come out here and try to play like Jan Lennard Struff. He's going to try to dictate at all costs. He's going to hit his forehand flat and aggressive on almost every single swing, really. He's going to come to net that often. He's going to serve like that with kind of the, you know, barely any toss and the really kind of ultra slicey uh, general. I mean, he, he's got a good flat serve and his serve's actually awesome. That's one part of his game. I, I can't say I, I ever really had anything against his serve, but it was just weird. It was just weird to see a player who, who was six feet tall implementing 
the uh, game style that uh, is much more typical of someone who uh, was much, much bigger. This very kind of all-out aggression kind of power tennis in terms of how J.J. Wolf tries to play. I was dubious. But I'm starting to realize that some of the rules just don't apply to him because he's just that talented. And I think the best way to see that is to look at his return. So let's go to some film study here. And um, here's what here's what I'll say just before we get into this. Most players have to make certain decisions on the return to serve. There's a give and take. If you move back, you give yourself more time. You can take a bigger swing, a longer swing, so to speak. Or you can move up and take more time away. But then you have to abbreviate your technique and you may have to abbreviate to such an extent that you actually have to block or chip the return of serve. J.J. Wolf is going to get the best of both worlds here. He's going to stand up, and he's going to take pretty big swings. So he's going to take time away, and he's going to try to bludgeon the ball at the same time. Well, you're, you're breaking rules here. You're not supposed to be able to do that. Not only that, but some players who, who do that, I have seen that before, will say, okay, well... If I'm going to do that, I'm going to guess. I'm going to anticipate to one side. If it comes to my forehand, I'm going to be waiting with my forehand grip, and I'm going to be ready to take that big aggressive cut. If it goes to my backhand, well, I'm not going to grip change, and I'm just going to block it. Or vice versa, backhand, forehand. Wolf is, is going to stand up. He's going to take a big cut, and he's not going to even guess. He's not going to sit on the forehand or a backhand. He's actually going to trust his reactions and his reflexes, and regardless of if he's going to have to hit a forehand or a backhand, is actually going to be ready to take a big swing at the ball with his drive grip. It's insane. Here he is at one love. Serve comes in for Felix. I'm going to slow this down for you. Uh, you can kind of see... The, the speed of, of a serve and why this is so difficult. J.J. Wolf hasn't really reacted yet, and the ball is approaching, I think, the, the net at this point uh, because that's how fast serves go. It, it's hard to react. So now he's going to begin his take back. He's got his kind of his, his elbow kind of tucked at his right hip. Look how extended he gets on the take back, though, as the ball has now bounced on his side of the court. This is a big take back. Wolf has kind of a strange technique on his forehand where he keeps his arm very, very straight. He hits through the ball very flat, generally speaking. Uh, but he's going to come through the ball. You can look at the path of his racket here. It's pretty significant. There's a lot of movement, a lot of motion, and the more the more kind of loud your technique is, the harder it is to time a return of serve, but Wolf cracks it perfectly on the nose and completely ropes this return at Felix's feet. Um, as you can see, there's barely any time to react because he's taken time away. He's taken this return relatively early. You see where he started. He kind of takes a, a, a forward hop on his split step from where he starts. He jumps forward. Uh, about like maybe a couple feet, and then he continues to move forward through the return of serve. So he's taking more and more time away, and he's taking a huge swing, and he's hitting, uh, you know, the ball very flat. It lands right at Felix's feet. They play a neutral rally. Now we see another first serve, by the way. These are first serves. Uh, Felix goes T this time. JJ changes his shirt. It's the second set now. And the backhand... It's a little bit easier for most double-handers especially to drive through the ball in their backhand uh, because naturally it's a little bit shorter and the take back is more abbreviated than it is on the forehand side. But once again, you know, he is going to take a, a pretty full-blooded cut at the ball on his backhand wing. Now this one doesn't have quite the aggressiveness that the previous return I showed you has, but he does take enough time away and he hits the ball well enough that that the return does its job and Felix has to hit a first ball backhand instead of a forehand and FA's approach shot is bad. Um, if, if Felix had a forehand approach shot, 
there's a 90% chance it would have been a lot better than this one. And Wolf is going to end up getting a passing shot that he can hit with his eyes closed. And he wins this point. So what, what do we learn about J.J. Wolf's return? You know, like what... What do we take away from the fact that he's breaking all these rules, that he's not guessing, he's not standing back, he's not chipping. Again, he's standing in and taking big swings and not guessing. Like, how 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 do we interpret this? Well, first of all, um, is it working? It, it did work this week because he faced big servers, Cressy, Bublik, FAA, and he challenged them on return. I don't know how many breaks of serve he got against Felix, but um, can I see that right now? Can I let break point saved? No, unfortunately, I can't see that right now. Sorry. Oh, actually, yes, I can. Stand by. Um, return break points converted four of 11. Oh, that was Molchan. Okay, one of one. Okay, so he only broke once against Felix, but uh, he broke. He broke Bublik's serve four times. He broke Cressy's serve twice, which is enough against Maxim Cressy. Uh, he avoided a tie break, won it six three six four. Maestrelli is a big server as well, who, by the way, I think is going to have a nice career uh, from what I've seen from him. Uh, broke Maestrelli's serve four times. Uh, Emer is not a big server. Broke him five times. Returns in play. First serve returns in play. Wolf has been around 50%, but which is not great. But sometimes players are at 50% against servers of that quality, and they're not trying to do that much with the return. Wolf, when he gets returns in play, he's actually, he's not neutralizing. He's generally in a great position uh, to win the point on the fourth shot of the rally. Like he is, he's basically able to gain an immediate advantage in the rally with his first serve returns. That's how aggressive he is on the return. So 50% is kind of where he's been. Uh, not great, not awful, but regardless of if it's going to be effective, and look, I'm not actually sure. I thought against Nick Kyrgios at the U.S. Open, uh, I was watching that match live, and I was like, uh, I'm like, wow, you know, you should probably have more respect for the best serve in the game. Move back, man. Like, let's get some returns in play here. He really struggled to get returns in play against Kyrgios, as do most, but uh, he he had the same strategy. I'm gonna. It doesn't matter who I'm facing. It could be Nick Kyrgios and his 135 mile per hour pinpoint first serves. I'm still gonna stand up and take aggressive first serve returns. Look, I don't know if it's sustainable at the highest level. I don't know. I'm gonna take like a let's wait and see on that. Here's what I do know: the fact that he's able to implement this with some success shows that. His hand skills, his coordination and timing are crazy impressive, even relative to professional tennis. Let's end on Dominic Team, who uh, made another semifinal, second of 2022. Uh, first on a hard court since the 2020 year-end championships when he beat Novak Djokovic. That was a very memorable match. He really redlined against Novak in that semifinal. Ended up uh, making the finals. That was uh, 2020. Played Daniil Medvedev, won the first set. Medvedev warmed down, made him tired, and, and uh, won the next two sets. So Daniil won the year-end title over team. Uh, teams teams made the—so so that was the second year in a row that team made the, the final at the uh, O2 Arena at the end of the season. So uh, a return to a hardcourt semifinal, that's pretty big. But uh, look, he's looking better and better. The forehand has been the main focus— of evaluating his form throughout this comeback, I'd say right now it's about 80% of what it was at its peak. And that's a huge improvement from where we started. I don't know if 80% as a number sounds like a bad thing to you or a good thing to you. All I can say is, you know, we started at maybe 30%, 40%, 50%. Now we're up at 80 and it's made a big difference. But my main takeaway from watching this week actually does not have anything to do with the forehand, but it has 
it has to do with the backhand. Uh, because, and I think this is encouraging, even if the forehand never gets all the way back, it looks to me like his backhand is going to pick up a little bit of slack. More slack than it was able to pick up earlier in his career. Maybe there's overcompensation going on right now when he's going for more on the backhand because he knows that he doesn't have that point finishing juice on a consistent basis on his forehand. And uh, I, I just think it's still just not as heavy and not as fast as it used to be. Uh, but one thing that has looked incredibly damaging and at times unplayable is his backhand down the line, which uh, he is playing as big as I've ever seen. As big as anyone, uh, as big as I've ever seen from any player, not just Dominic Team, uh, because the way he's able to flatten out that one hander, we talk about one handers having an ability to hit a heavier ball, but uh, Team has a flatter one handed backhand than most, and from the middle of the court is able to go down the line, but at an kind of an inside out angle, if you're catching my drift. So, uh, what I mean by that is the ball is actually moving. Uh, towards the sideline, right? It's not a linear down the line shot from, you know, wh where it's going in a in a straight line along the sideline. I'm talking about the shot where he has a backhand from the middle of the court and he almost hits an inside out backhand from the middle. Uh, he can do that. Obviously, he can go down the line from, you know, uh, closer to the sideline position and he can hit kind of a straighter down the line backhand. But the way he's able to flatten that out and get the ball to actually move off the court is uh, very, very unique. And the speed of that shot far surpasses what 95% of players can do on the backhand side. I think it's a huge weapon. And he's kind of brought that fearless delivery of power that we've seen throughout his career on the forehand wing. He's brought it to his backhand now where... He's asking his backhand to do a lot. He probably was asking it to do too much against Andre Rublev. It was the most error-prone shot on the court in the semifinal against Andre Rublev. But all in all, I thought he played that match really well. Great performance by Rublev. Uh, I, I don't think there was any shame in that loss. And I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a path to Dominic Team's return to success with you know, even if he's limited in some ways on the forehand, which is good. That is a good thing because uh, it's not a guarantee that we ever see teams forehand become, you know, the biggest forehand in men's tennis again, which uh, at a certain time, it certainly was. I think him and Matteo Berrettini and Rafael Nadal was, uh, was the triumvirate there. Uh, it's possible we never see, see team get there. And if that's the case, uh, we've talked about it with so many players. Y you have to adapt. There has to be a give and take. And I think that backhand might be it. And by the way, he can use it in combination with his slice really, really well. He's got a great ability now uh, to, to use his backhand slice to change up the pace in the rally, um, to do certain things. Uh, matchup specific that are advantageous tactically and to get players to hit up on the ball in that backhand to backhand exchange, which can sometimes really set up uh, that aggressive drive. You know, the, the slice that kind of brings players inside the court out of position to defend. Uh, again, you know, you draw the weaker reply and then you open up the court for offense. So I love the combination of the power he brings on the drive backhand and uh, especially when he's mixing in the slice, which now he does better than ever. His backhand might be better than it was pre-wrist surgery. And that was my takeaway from watching Dominic Team in Hyon, Spain this week. That'll be it for this week's edition of Monday Match Analysis. Uh, the next Hulk video is in progress. That is the news I will leave you with. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.